Kia ora, everyone. Um, so I'm going to go through the asthma guidelines. Uh, and I, you know, asthma guidelines are full of information. So I'm just going to pick out a few of the things that I think are key from this guideline, which was published last year. So the New Zealand Child Asthma Guideline. Um, and I've just acknowledged the people that were involved in this guideline at the bottom of the slide. Uh, this guideline is really based for children between the age of 1 to 12, with adolescents moving into the adult guideline now. Uh, and we haven't focused on under ones in the guideline because under ones who wheeze are bronchiolitis and we know they don't respond to things like salbutamol and steroids. The first thing around the guideline is making sure we've got the correct diagnosis. Is this child actually got asthma? What makes asthma their likely diagnosis? And in New Zealand, our way of diagnosing is your clinical assessment, looking at signs and symptoms and seeing if they respond to asthma treatment. Uh, so some of the things that you guys will know and recognise is that they present with wheeze. They may have a cough, particularly at night. They seem to be triggers, viral infections, they get wheezy. They do exercise, they get wheezy. Or there might just be a really strong family history of asthma, which makes it more likely, or the child themselves has eczema, atopy. There's also, you know, if you hear wheeze on exam, that's going to increase your probability. But one of the key things is thinking about the things that make asthma less likely. So has this child got daily symptoms from birth? Have they got a frequent wet cough, which makes cystic fibrosis or bronchiectasis more likely? Or have they got other signs of sort of other chronic lung disease? Uh, there are sort of objective ways of diagnosing asthma, so using lung function, which might show obstructive uh, pattern, exhaled nitric oxide, um, and checking for eosinophils. But these aren't tests that are widely available, even in secondary care, um, so they don't feature as a large part of our um, guidelines. Uh, this flow chart here, so this is for the children sort of that 5 to 11 year age. So you suspect that they have diagnosis on your history and exam. And so we label them as suspected asthma. <coughs> they then go forward for a trial of asthma therapy. So this is where you give, you know, inhaled corticosteroids for a period of at least eight weeks to see whether they respond. The reason for using suspected asthma is if you're not the next health practitioner who gets to review this child, you're aware that the diagnosis may not have been confirmed. And it's once they respond to treatment the way you think they should that we then label them as asthma. Um, and if they're not responding, again, we reassess diagnosis and at that stage is often when, our, when we recommend doing spirometry. So most asthma guidelines split uh, management up into those preschool wheezes and the, pre the school age wheezes, um, with the cutoff being five. And this is because we know preschool wheeze does behave differently. And you know, a lot of the children who have preschool wheeze won't have asthma when they reach school age. Uh, both parts of the guideline have that stepwise approach in terms of if you have frequent symptoms, you're requiring your salbutamol more than twice a week, um, or you've had a severe episode requiring steroids in the previous 12 months, then you step up. But just as important as stepping up is reviewing these children and stepping down treatment once they've been stable. And it is a constant sort of cycle of up and down over time. Uh, all children who have preschool wheeze who have had a response to salbutamol should have access to a reliever. Uh, but the majority of children who um, have preschool wheeze will fit into this infrequent wheeze group and don't require maintenance therapy. Uh, if, however, they do have frequent or severe symptoms, the first step in treatment is trialling a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. And although most children with regular symptoms benefit from being on this continuously, there is a subset of children who have frequent viral infections and frequent wheeze, who you may actually use that intermittently at the first sign of an acute illness. If on the inhaled corticosteroids you still feel that the control's not good, the next step is step three, which you add in Montelukast. Um, and at this step, or if you've still not got good control, is when referral through to paediatricians is recommended for review. And when we see them, the first thing we often do is go through and clarify whether we think we've got the right diagnosis, looking at adherence, um, and that usually is where we get to. So moving on to the older group, so children 5 to 11. Again, it looks very similar in terms of the stepwise approach, stepping up and stepping down. All children should have access to the reliever to use if they had a, um, acute flare-up of symptoms, and most children will be on salbutamol as their reliever. Uh, 
The majority of children with mild asthma who have infrequent se swim symptoms um, don't need to be on an inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, but the first step of treatment is low dose inhaled corticosteroids. And I guess one thing I wanted to highlight from this step is that it is a low dose. Um, and I'll show a slide of some low doses examples on coming up. If you're low dose, it doesn't control your symptoms. So like I said before, if you're using salbutamol more than twice a week, have waking up at night with a cough, or you've required steroids in the previous 12 months, then escalation of treatment up to using a combined inhaler. So an inhaled corticosteroid still at that low dose um, and adding in a labber. If you have poor control on that combined inhaler, the next steps can be increasing the um, strength of your steroid to a standard dose. So standard doses are equivalent to what you start with with adults um, or in adding in Monte Lucast. Uh, and if, you know, majority of children with asthma should respond to a low dose combined inhaler. And if they're not, then thinking about referral through to pediatrics at that stage. And the things, like I said on the previous side, in pediatrics is again reviewing diagnosis, adherence, inhaler technique. Um, but we do have access to other medications such as biologics, which we use um, very infrequently. So I just added this in from the guideline just to highlight that low dose inhaled corticosteroid. Um, and I guess the one I would most commonly use would be flexitide. And I would prescribe it as a 50 microgram inhaler, one puff twice a day. And these seem quite low and, you know, looking back, you know, um, before I did sort of pediatric respiratory, I always thought you had to prescribe two puffs twice a day. Um, but actually one puff of 50 milligrams is enough and will achieve 80 to 90 percent of maximum efficacy. So although going up on dose may give you some added benefit, it probably doesn't necessarily outweigh added side effects. As well as medication that, you know, what medication you're going to prescribe and how much. I think one of the more important things is actually how you're going to deliver that medication. So we know children under the age of two can't go to get a good seal around a spacer. Uh, and so they have to use their spacer with a mask. Between the age of two to four, some children can start to get quite a good seal on a spacer. But if they present with an acute flare, they often can't. They're so too short of breath, they're too wheezy, they're upset, distressed, and so we revert back to using a mask. By the time you reach five, you should be able to use a spacer quite well. Uh, and we recommend all children continue to use a spacer. Uh, and one of the other points around this is that actually you just need to continually show people how to use them, make sure they're using it properly. And there was one study that said, you know, you could teach perfect inhaler technique, they can do it perfectly in front of you, but two to four weeks later, their technique starts to drop. So it actually drops off quite quickly. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of quick points about labbers. So using them by themselves is not recommended. So they should always be used in conjunction with inhaled corticosteroid. The two ones we commonly would prescribe would be serotide and Simbacort. Uh, and we avoid using these in children under the age of four. So just to touch on adolescents, because obviously they still make up quite a large part of our pediatrics, and actually they get to that tricky stage where they're starting to take control over their asthma treatment. Um, and there has, so this, these have sort of moved into the adult guidelines now, and there has been a change in the last few years around uh, management of asthma in this group. So it's no longer recommended to give salbutamol for mild asthmatics to use as a reliever when needed. Um, and we should be using salbutamol in conjunction with inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, and the reason for this is they think if you're on salbutamol itself, you give increased risk of exacerbations and also increased mortality. So now the alternative is prescribing a combined inhaler. So an inhaled corticosteroid in a labba and using this as your reliever. So you could be using this just as your reliever without any ongoing maintenance, um, or you use it as a maintenance inhaler plus as your reliever, which is known as the SMART regime. There will be patients who much prefer to still be on the regular flexitide twice a day and use salbutamol as needed as well. So, um, but that's sort of the way the guidelines are going. Uh, so just, again, just to touch on the SMART therapy, so the inhaler we use is Simbacort, uh, and you would prescribe it as a maintenance dose. Um, we would usually start one puff twice a day of the 100 over 6 tubuhaler. If they're having symptoms um, and need relief, then they can use additional puffs throughout the day. 
obviously when they present to us with their acute flare-ups um, or present to GP with acute wheeze, then we would still be using salbutamol as part of our um, acute management. Uh, serotide doesn't work in the same way as Simbacort, so it's not used in the same regime. Um, and as you saw from the guideline stepwise approach, um, we don't use it as first line in children under 12, but there will be some children that we consider it in. So I thought I'd just break the guidelines up with a case that I actually saw about three weeks ago now, um, who highlighted some of these points to me. So this was a lovely 11-year-old Māori girl who was seen in our bronchiectasis clinic. She has mild bronchiectasis and a diagnosis of asthma. Uh, she, from a chest point of view, has been great. No recent exacerbations. She doesn't have a wet cough. And her chest was pristine, completely clear. Uh, and when I got her to cough in clinic, it was dry. She had been prescribed flexatide, she was on 50 micrograms twice a day, uh, and salbutamol, which she said she used a little bit, um, but she really did complain of some exercise limitations. So she felt over the last couple of years she couldn't run as fast as the other girls in her class, and she was waking at night um, coughing, which she thought was probably just because she'd had lots of viruses. Um, but luckily in our clinic, we can actually do um, lung function, which was helpful in this case. So she had a moderately severe obstructive pattern. Uh, and I guess the key thing is that her FEV1 was 59%. And I'm reviewing her spirometry over clinic for the past couple of years. It had just sort of just been trending down over the last two years, despite her, from a bronchiectasis point of view, being clinically well. Uh, so checked her inhaler technique, which was terrible. She wasn't using a spacer. She would puff it, not even in her mouth. And um, she also hadn't picked up any prescriptions for at least uh, six months. So her compliance probably wasn't good either. We actually changed her to a Simbacort turbohaler, which she seemed to be able to use and was feeling happier to have this and made sure she had an asthma action plan and reviewed her again in three months. And in three months time, it was nice to see that her FEV1 had improved significantly. She still had mild obstruction, um, but her bronchi and her bronchodilator response was still positive. She, had, she did normalise, suggesting this is all asthma rather than bronchiectasis. Uh, so for me, I think it highlighted this importance of this continuous reassessment. So you make the diagnosis, you're reassessing the diagnosis, you're checking inhaler technique at every opportunity and providing education where you can as well. Uh, so part of the guideline now is around this sort of continuous reassessment and not waiting for patients to present to you to review their technique. But if you haven't seen them for three or four months, it's a good idea to see them if you can. Uh, so ways of assessing control, there's sort of two tools that I would use. Um, one is the asthma control test, which is quite good. It gives you a number and you can track it over time. Um, but also the GINA assessment, which asks four questions. Um, and the girl that I'd seen in clinic would have come up uncontrolled if I'd gone through this in clinic. As well as medication, so non-pharmacological measures are just as important in the management of asthma in paediatrics. Um, avoiding triggers, so reducing house dust mite if you can, um, chlorine swimming pools if that's their trigger, uh, particularly smoking and vaping as well. Um, encouraging exercise, so I think like um, Cass said before, you know, often these children are protected and their physical activity can be limited, but actually encouraging them to be physically active is important. Um, identifying so social triggers for why they may be using a lot more salbutamol, particularly dysfunctional breathing, um, and keeping their nose clear. Uh, and just a list of other things to help. Um, a couple of things, particularly is asthma action plan. So we know that very few numbers of children actually uh, do have an asthma action plan, but they are beneficial um, and recommending the flu vaccine as well. Um, Acute management, so I guess the key thing around acute management yeah, <laughs> is that um, the majority of children who present within a flare of asthma can be managed with a spacer um, and oral steroids. Um, if they're not responding to their bronchodilator or they're needing repeated doses within two hours, then that's when referral through to hospital. Uh, and all children should go home with an inhaled corticosteroid if they've had a severe exacerbation. And the important thing when you're assessing asthma is to try and determine that severity. But like I said, majority of these children in mild, moderate and severe will be managed with salbutamol virus spacer and oral steroids. And it's the life-threatening group that are 
a hypoxic that we tend to use nebulizers for. Uh, so obviously you can access the guidelines in full on the Asthma Foundation website. There's also links on health pathways and Starship guidelines as well. Thank you. Thank you.